Welcome everyone. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, wanted to take a few minutes uh, and present uh, some cases that I had put together on complex uh, pediatric deformity, uh, really uh, focusing uh, on uh, some less common and challenging pathologies uh, that really uh, uh, kind of showcase the, the spectrum of challenges that we often see in our pediatric spine populations uh, with some specific attention being uh, paid to um, some uh, aspects of these cases where we had to you know, dig a little bit deeper in the toolbox and find some creative strategies, uh, both with our technology and our implants uh, in order to try to come up with uh, some good solutions uh, for these kids with some real tough problems. So my goals for this talk are number one to present, uh, as I said, uh, several uh, cases uh, of uh, various uh, etiologies get some diversity in the um, uh, in the pathologies being treated, uh, and second, discuss uh, the options that were present for management of these uh, kids. Uh, with all of these cases, I I think that um, there were uh, multiple right answers in terms of how they could be approached, and uh, I'll obviously share my thought process, but. Uh, part of the fun in going through these uh, in preparing for this uh, talk was uh, to think about ways that, you know, other options that I could have chosen or other options that, that others may have chosen. And so my goal tonight is not to say this is the, the best way to do this or the, the absolute right way, but uh, just to share my experiences and, um, you know, some, some of the outcomes were better than others. And some, I'll also talk about some of the lessons that I learned in the process. Uh, third, we'll review the operative strategies and really look at uh, what some of our newer uh, implants and uh, technology, specifically navigation, can bring to the table in terms of letting us uh, get uh, better outcomes or uh, uh, reduce uh, safety risks that otherwise would have been present. And finally, we'll um, kind of evaluate what I might have done differently in these cases and, and uh, with the uh, value of, of looking back in hindsight. So the first case is a 12-year-old female who was initially diagnosed with scoliosis at an early age. So this was an early onset idiopathic curve. Um, she was uh, seen in our clinics initially at about age seven or eight. I did not meet her at that time and met her later on. She was uh, treated with a brace for about a year and uh, was relatively compliant, but then outgrew the brace and the family for various reasons did not pursue returning to the clinic to get a new brace. Uh, surgery was then recommended as the curve uh, began to progress and that was in 2017. Uh, family uh, then had another two year gap where they didn't follow up and uh, uh, presented uh, back to our clinics in March of 2019. It's an otherwise uh, healthy and active uh, kid with uh, no significant medical problems and uh, no family history of scoliosis. Her neurologic exam was uh, otherwise normal. She didn't have any upper motor neuron signs or um, hyperreflexia, anything that would be concerning uh, for the development of myelopathy. These were her presenting x-rays when I first met her. Uh, so she has a uh, main thoracic right apex curve in excess of 105 degrees uh, and uh, pretty significant proximal thoracic and uh, lumbar curves as well. Uh, the lateral view shows us that she has a fairly significant thoracic kyphosis as part of this deformity and a, uh, a notable coronal imbalance as well. When we look at uh, her supine and flexibility films, uh, we can classify this to be a um, high magnitude linky 4B plus curve, uh, and uh, this is her coronal MRI, which uh, just shows the cord draped over the apex of the concavity of the curve, but with no uh, substantial cord thinning and no cord signal change. And so in thinking through how to tackle this case, um, I really uh, just had a feeling that I didn't want to do it in one day. Uh, I felt that um, this uh, would be a, a pretty major correction for her to undergo all at one time. And so I considered preoperative uh, halo gravity traction and also consider using temporary internal distraction. And I elected for the latter, the temporary internal distraction, uh, because uh, 
felt uh, that that would allow me to go in and, and uh, do my uh, planned Pani osteotomies and place all of her uh, screws on day one. Uh, and in the process of, of doing that work, uh, apply some gradual distraction across the concavity um, throughout that day. Let her rest for a few days, make sure uh, neurologically that everything remained normal and then come back uh, for what I'd hoped would be a, re a relatively short day uh, to uh, place the final rods, do the final correction, and uh, try to maximize the amount of correction that we could get uh, for this young lady. Uh, family was in agreement with that plan, and they also liked uh, the idea of, of avoiding uh, several weeks of halo gravity traction. Um, just logistically, our patient population uh, comes from uh, a pretty wide geographic area in terms of driving distance and these families often don't have um, a lot of resources to be making a lot of trips uh, to our uh, city for, for care. So uh, doing this over one hospital stay was appealing to the family. Also given the various lapses we'd had with consistent follow-up with them, uh, I wanted to more or less uh, uh, develop a, a treatment strategy where we had uh, a good amount of control over, over the situation. So uh, we went ahead and uh, proceeded uh, with the two-stage uh, temporary internal distraction strategy. And these are a couple uh, shots uh, demonstrating my construct on that day. So the left-hand radiograph is the proximal construct. And you can see that I had placed uh, distal screws at that point um, and rib hooks at the uh, proximal end of the major curve. Distally, I used a DR mass screw, uh, which I found to be a really helpful technique for these internal distraction constructs uh, to where I can keep the, the temporary rod out laterally so that when I do place my main rod, uh, it's easy to place that in the um, more medial uh, portion of that DR mass screw and not have to remove um, the uh, internal dis distraction rod and lose some correction while I place that rod. Um, so uh, the first stage was successful and uh, we got a, a pretty substantial correction at that time, and we returned for a planned second stage four days later. She had no um, spinal cord monitoring changes during the first stage and no neurologic uh, issues in those intervening four days. So six months post-op, uh, these are her films. And again, some of these cases I don't have the traditional two-year follow-up on. Um, and so I show them more as an illustration of the technique and our early outcomes. Um, and knowing that uh, obviously uh, problems can develop over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, but at this point, she's doing great. She is extremely happy with her outcome. Um, and looking at and so kind of self-critiquing my radiographs, I'm very happy with the, the thoracic correction. There's a slight shoulder asymmetry radiographically, which really is not uh, as apparent uh, clinically, and her coronal and sagittal balance are, are quite good. Uh, we improved her thoracic kyphosis. Um, in terms of where I uh, uh, started the construct distally, I elected to go to L4. Um, and if you look back at the, uh, the preoperative upright films, L3 was really the apex of her lumbar curve, and so I didn't feel comfortable stopping there. I initially did have L4 a little bit more level, but in, in uh, doing some compression and distraction, the left-sided L4 screw did uh, begin to pull out. And so I had to reposition that and then I didn't want to overstress it. So all in all, I think uh, her, her coronal balance is good. Um, there's a, a slight amount of wedging there um, at L4, L5, uh, uh, but we use those DR mass screws uh, for a third rod uh, just across the uh, Ponte osteotomies to provide some more stability there at the end of the case. So temporary internal distraction um, has uh, been utilized now for a number of years and uh, based on uh, the first uh, initial descriptions uh, uh, by uh, uh, Drs. Buhovsky, Skaggs, and Spahn Seller. Uh, and there are a couple of nice articles, one of them being a technique article on JBGS that really um, show their strategies and the, uh, uh, the uh, flexibility that this, this technique gives you um, for various uh, types of deformities in various curve etiologies. In other words, it's useful for, for neuromuscular children. It's useful for idiopathic kids, as we showed in this case here. Um, uh, and it is a, a good alternative to halo gravity traction in kids uh, where that may not be a good option, uh, either based on their uh, 
bone physiology, real thin cranial bone, or their cognitive status or social issues. Um, and uh, typically, uh, for their description, it's one to two distraction procedures and a definitive fusion. Uh, and, and in my case, I did one distraction procedure and then the definitive uh, uh, final fusion. So just going through my workflow on this case, I initially did my uh, facetectomies and six pontiosteotomies across the apex of the main thoracic curve. And I used navigation to place uh, the distal screws first. So typically I'll um, uh, place screws from about T9 or T10 bend down distally to my planned um, LIV. Uh, DR mass screws uh, can be, in this case, um, uh, you know, at the distal end of the curve, uh, and even lower than that, uh, depending on, on uh, the uh, type of curve that you're dealing with. But I would uh, personally recommend not putting it at, at the LIV so that you're not uh, loosening that crucial LIV screw uh, through these uh, distraction um, uh, maneuvers that you do uh, throughout the, the course of the treatment. I put rib hooks, uh, upgoing rib hooks at the proximal end of the major curve. And then uh, placed my distraction rod construct using a domino connector, side-to-side uh, -side domino, and some sliding rods. I added distraction in small increments uh, through the case, uh, usually about four or five clicks at a time, check monitoring, let it sit for a couple minutes, and then add a little bit more um, distraction. And it's a key uh, point there to note that you don't want to uh, apply any distraction while you're doing navigation, because that can uh, change the um, accuracy of, of the navigation. I did then uh, place my proximal screws using navigation after I had completed uh, my distraction maneuvers. And then uh, uh, placed my concave uh, primary correction rod, uh, which uh, uh, was a titanium rod at the end of the first uh, stage uh, so that I could achieve some correction, but um, would not be overstretching the screws and would not be kind of going for broke on a full curve correction. At this time, I was able to uh, release the um, uh, distraction rod uh, if, if I needed to, and then uh, plan to uh, uh, place the uh, definitive uh, concave rod uh, with that distraction rod in place at the beginning of the second uh, stage case of the case. And finally, uh, we placed a convex rod uh, using a cantilever differential bend technique to uh, derotate across the apex, uh, and I, I did some uh, segmental derotation as well level to level. So I do think that the temporary and general distraction gives the surgeon a substantial amount of control over, um, over how much distraction they are inducing at any given time, um, uh, particularly if, you're, if your construct remains stable during that process. Uh, I do think the amount of flexibility that you have is inherent to A, the, the beginning flexibility of the curve uh, based on your preoperative planning, and then also the number of osteotomies that you're doing, um, particularly ponte osteotomies. I do think it really does loosen up those large uh, uh, thoracic curves nicely. In terms of limitations, uh, you know, if you over distract, you can tear out your, uh, your fixation points, which again is why I would suggest not having those fixation points being either the UIV or the LIV. And uh, depending on the bone quality of the patient, uh, you may elect to place more fixation points. Um, uh, whereas in a kid, an ambulatory kid with good bone quality, you can get away with fewer fixation points. So uh, somewhat similar to, to the case that I've shown. Moving on now to our second case, a uh, little bit different uh, pathology with this child. So um, my patient was an eight-year-old female who was diagnosed at a young age um, uh, uh, with congenital scoliosis, maybe not as, as young as we often see in our clinics, but uh, age six. So this was identified um, during early childhood. Surgery was initially recommended as the deformity was already relatively significant, uh, but at that time, uh, the patient's family was unable to afford the procedure. Uh, they later relocated to Arkansas and had uh, better access to healthcare and uh, medicine at our clinic. Her past medical history uh, was notable really only for occasional urinary incontinence, uh, 
and chronic constipation, but no um, uh, consistent severe uh, bowel or bladder dysfunction. Otherwise, she was neurologically normal on her uh, extremity exam. Uh, she had had three abdominal hernia surgeries. Uh, no underlying uh, syndrome had been diagnosed and cognitively, this was a normal child. So here are her presenting radiographs to our clinic and uh, kind of relevant to later on in, in the uh, management of this patient, her standing height at the time, uh, T1 to S1 was 115 centimeters. Um, she had a uh, um, hemivertebra partially segmented here at the thoracolumbar junction uh, and a substantial coronal imbalance, which was the most notable uh, clinical feature of this patient. Uh, she had a very abnormal gait just because she was working so hard to to hold herself uh, uh, in a relatively functional coronal alignment. Uh, sagittally, she had a, a pretty normal uh, alignment in that regard. And this uh, uh, zoomed in view here kind of be better characterizes her hemivertebra. Bend films demonstrated that this was a pretty stiff deformity as one would expect with a congenital curve. Um, she does have an abnormally shaped uh, pelvis here as well. Um, and uh, um, so I do think that, you know, perhaps she's somewhere along the, the bacterial spectrum, just uh, not really with any other uh, clinical or radiographic features of that, but uh, um, not, not quite a normal lumbopelvic uh, uh, junction and pelvic shape. MRI did not show any uh, intrathecal anomalies or spinal cord abnormalities. And so in thinking through how to manage this patient, uh, I knew that we needed to deal with the hemivertebra to prevent that uh, acute uh, scoliotic curve from worsening. But given the significant uh, coronal imbalance that uh, she displayed, I felt that we needed uh, some sort of instrumentation that extended above and below uh, the uh, planned area of the hemivertebra resection in order to improve and control her coronal alignment. Um, I feel humor me for a minute, I'm going to flip back to the, the uh, preoperative films. And this uh, prone view here in traction, which we took uh, on the day of surgery, um, uh, uh, demonstrates that uh, you know, the, the uh, coronal balance was going to continue to be an issue. And once we resected the hemivertebra, we likely would cause her thoracic spine to be even more to the right and, and potentially even worse in the coronal imbalance. So I felt something more than just a limited hemivertebra excision uh, was necessary in this patient. And uh, I think that that uh, thought is, is perhaps debatable and, and many people may have tackled this differently. Um, but I decided here to uh, do a hemivertebra excision uh, using a three rod technique and fusion, uh, you know, essentially one level above and below the, the hemivertebra uh, with Shilla instrumentation uh, extending into the proximal thoracic spine and then down uh, into the distal lumbar spine to give good overall coronal and sagittal control. And that's what we did. So in uh, these uh, radiographs here, um, where the crosslink is and where you can see this third rod attached to laminar hooks, that's where the hemi hemivertebra excision was performed um, uh, using a, a VCR uh, lateral extracavitary type uh, exposure uh, for hemivertebra resection. Uh, and fusion at those levels, and then placement of the sliding Schilla screws uh, in the mid and upper thoracic spine, and then in the lumbar spine distally to L4. Um, I was happy with our alignment uh, postoperatively, as was the patient and her family. They noticed a substantial improvement for her. Um, she then uh, followed up for one or two visits, maybe out to about uh, six months after surgery, and then we lost her uh, to follow up until very recently. Uh, she returned down at three years post-op, now with a standing height of 134 centimeters. Um, and you can see that uh, in comparing these uh, views, she really has uh, grown towards the end of the rods as we had hoped she would uh, with a Schilla construct. Um, clinically, she is uh, standing with good alignment. She's walking well, no back pain. Um, critiquing these x-rays a bit. Uh, I, I did um, close down her osteotomy entirely to really where there was no space even for an inner body graft. Uh, but uh, I do think that sometimes doing that in the thoracic spine or at the thoracolumbar junction is maybe not quite as satisfying in terms of the radiographic coronal correction as 
uh, if you do it in the lumbar spine where there's more flexibility. Um, and uh, over time, the uh, distal screws here have pulled back a bit, although I, I do still think they're holding her uh, fairly well. Um, uh, those those uh, L4 screws and, and comparing the immediate post-op and, and more recent uh, follow-up films have pulled back a bit. And we often do see that in the Shilla patients and it's typically asymptomatic and um, the patients are able to, to largely maintain their correction. Uh, so I utilize the, uh, the uh, three rod technique that has been described uh, by the Boston Children's Surgeon, specifically Dr. Hedequist. And we did a, a T10 to L1 uh, spinal fusion, as I mentioned. And then the Shilla instrumentation extended T3 to L4. Um, she is uh, still premenarchal and still growing. And so at some point she may grow off those Shilla rods. Uh, I would likely then uh, do her definitive fusion rather than revising to a second uh, set of Shilla rods. Um, and I'm hopeful that we could stop that defini definitive fusion at L3, uh, but we may need to continue to use uh, L4 as our LIV. And this is the uh, paper from Boston that I found to be so helpful over the years. Um, uh, the authors uh, reported on 10 patients with hemivirbra who underwent uh, hemivirbra excision and a short segment fusion using a three rod, three rod technique. Uh, their mean age uh, was four years, and so that is uh, younger than our patient who we operated on when she was age eight. And uh, their uh, mean preoperative curve was about 44 degrees uh, with excellent correction down to uh, nine degrees uh, on uh, uh, their follow-up films. Four of these cases were thoracic and six lumbar. I think that doing the short segment fusion for the hemivertebra excision uh, really has very minimal impact on the overall growth potential of the child, which is one reason why I think it's a, a very useful technique. I think that this case, one of the reasons I wanted to select it and present it and open this up for discussion is that I do think that the Shilla technique uh, can be uh, combined with various other techniques such as a VCR or a hemivertebra excision uh, uh, very nicely. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of utility and a lot of um, uh, variability in how Shilla can be used uh, to address overall spinal balance uh, while still allowing the surgeon to address a, a fairly specific uh, problem with, uh, within the spine. My next case was a 12-year-old female with neurofibromatosis uh, who had not been followed uh, by any um, uh, specific uh, NF specialists uh, or multidisciplinary clinics for several years. Uh, I, uh, this is a relatively recent case, and um, so I had met her after they had uh, uh, been referred from their pediatrician uh, due to pretty substantial uh, worsening of a thoracic and shoulder deformity over about uh, 18 months to two years. Uh, the mother also has neurofibromatosis, as is often the, uh, the case with these kids. There's a, a family history. Um, and the uh, patient at this time has near daily back pain that is uh, substantially worse uh, with any type of physical activity. On exam, uh, she did have a substantial uh, um, thoracic scoliosis uh, and uh, um, kyphotic prominence to the upper thoracic spine, as you'll see on the radiographs in a minute. Uh, but uh, as has been the case with these other children I've talked about tonight, uh, no neurologic deficits, no core dysfunction. So here were her presenting radiographs uh, with a very acute uh, 107 degree upper thoracic curve, also causing a, a pretty substantial compensatory cervical deformity. Uh, and uh, below that, more of a sweeping uh, uh, thoracic lumbar curve, uh, contributing to a, a coronal imbalance, um, and that measured about 50 degrees. Uh, in the upper thoracic spine, uh, there was a, a substantial uh, acute kyphosis as well at the, at the same location as the scoliosis. Slight sagittal imbalance. In working her up further, we got our standard uh, flexibility films, uh, which showed a slight uh, uh, correction, maybe to about 90 or 95 degrees uh, when the patient was supine, and the bending film really didn't show anything uh, substantial in terms of bending flexibility. Uh, we got a 3D CT scan and uh, built a 3D model 
uh, to better uh, study the anatomy. And again, that shows a, a very uh, acute uh, curve. Um, and uh, you know, one thing I uh, took note of here was uh, the uh, position of the ribs and, and my belief that the, the uh, ribs were, were contributing pretty substantially to uh, her overall uh, stiffness. Um, slight penciling of some of the ribs, not too, too severe. And interestingly, when we got her MRI, uh, the main finding was, was not a large neurofibroma uh, uh, surrounding the spinal cord at, at the apex, but rather it was a uh, Chiari 1 malformation. And she had a uh, searing that had developed in the lower uh, thoracic cord. Um, really didn't have too much of a history of uh, substantial headaches or any um, um, sleep apnea, uh, other uh, bulbar sign neurologic deficits, uh, but uh, would went ahead and referred this immediately to my neurosurgery colleagues, uh, who agreed that she needed a uh, Chiari decompression, and so she underwent that over the summer, uh, in the midst of the uh, coronavirus, the first uh, uh, coronavirus uh, shutdown in our state, um, uh, to uh, go ahead and, and get that done and, and uh, open up the. Um, possibility for us to do her, her scoliosis correction. Um, I, I do think that it is much safer neurologically to undertake a big correction like that after the Chiari has been uh, decompressed and the uh, neurosurgeons were in agreement with that. So it's been a very effective collaboration uh, at our center and um, uh, went really to the benefit of, of this patient. After that was done, so about two months after the Chiari decompression, uh, in this patient, I did undertake halo gravity traction. Uh, I felt that her curve um, was um, acute and substantial enough in magnitude to where we needed to do that. And also, I knew that based on the uh, CT and the MRI that my fixation points were going to be very challenging due to her dural ectasia. Uh, and so I did not think that a temporary internal distraction technique would be as effective in her uh, for those reasons. The NF kids often have real thin bone, and so I did an eight pin halo uh, for her. Uh, we were real careful with uh, tensioning those pins. Um, with uh, families uh, that are uh, pretty reliable uh, at our center, we will often start the patients off with inpatient traction and work up to a goal weight and then um, have them return home for the remainder of their traction treatment. Um, this uh, has logistically worked well. The families um, it's often a tough sell to have them uh, in-house for six or eight weeks. Um, there are kids that we will do that with. We have one in-house right now, um, but she has very substantial pulmonary issues uh, and a, a much more uh, tenuous exam. Uh, this child remained neurologically stable throughout her initial inpatient uh, attraction. And so we felt comfortable with her going home. Uh, family was compliant with the traction and uh, we had her up to about 30 pounds. She was a very thin child, so this was a substantial portion of her um, overall weight, probably got her up to about 40% um, percent of her body weight uh, with that traction. This film uh, was taken probably about four weeks into that traction and showed that we had corrected her to about uh, 85 degrees and uh, improved her coronal balance, began to open up her um, ribs there in the upper portion of the rib cage. So I was encouraged by our initial results of the traction. We did a one stage correction with her. I fused T1 to L2. Um, we placed our pedicle screws with navigation and this I found to be exceptionally helpful in our Marfans and neurofibromatosis kids with dural ectasia um, because the pedicle anatomy can, can be so challenging. So I have uh, various um, gear shifts that uh, are available. Uh, we have uh, some very uh, small diameter um, straight tips that are navigated and then the more classic uh, linky uh, curve tip uh, uh, gear shifts, uh, both a right curve and a left curve, uh, depending on what side of the spine you're on. And those have been really helpful uh, once you're um, ventral to the canal to then uh, get a, a good path into the vertebral body uh, uh, through a real thin pedicle. I performed five pondy osteotomies, T2 to T7, 
And I think importantly for my ultimate outcome, I went ahead and uh, resected the uh, um, rib heads, uh, T3, the uh, third, fourth, and fifth ribs uh, bilaterally, um, essentially doing a thoracoplasty bilaterally uh, to really release those ribs at the apex and allow the apex to move uh, once we began our correction. Um, she had no viable pedicles at about four or five um, um, points in the upper thoracic spine. And so um, there I uh, decided to util utilize the translace uh, uh, fixation points, uh, which I found to be a very, very helpful um, tool in a number of cases. Uh, for example, this one where there are not good pedicles or if I've managed to uh, blow out a pedicle or misplace a screw that I can't salvage. It's an excellent bailout technique um, uh, and gives a very powerful correction. I've been very happy with it. Um, at the very top of the construct, I did not use a translace at the, at the UIV, but I did place uh, two downgoing uh, transverse process hooks um, to uh, be able to hopefully apply some compression and bring her right shoulder down uh, at the end of the correction. So here are my post-op films. These are my um, uh, post-op films from clinic two months uh, after the fact. Uh, so again, kind of doing a, a self-critique. I'm, I'm very happy with the overall correction. Um, looking at the rib spread, I think we've done good work in terms of opening up her thoracic cavity and her uh, both her coronal and sagittal balance are quite good. Um, I do think that we obtained a, a, a pretty powerful correction using those translaces, which I've outlined here with the red arrows. Three translaces on the uh, concave side, and then I ended up using one on the convex side where I had initially placed a hook and it pulled out. Um, intraoperatively, these two top hooks um, had good fixation, and I used um, a moderately forceful cantilever um, differential bend technique to try to take some of that upper thoracic rotation out uh, where I engaged the rod approximately in the hooks first and then uh, worked it distally down into the remainder of the thoracic spine. Um, it held well uh, in the OR and our, on our initial post-op films, uh, but when she came back to clinic, I was suspicious that at least this top hook had popped off and I got a limited CT scan of that area and indeed it had. It was slightly prominent, not especially painful or bothersome to the patient. And so after discussing with the patient and her mom, at the moment, we're just gonna observe that. She has had a lot of surgery over the last few months with both this and the halo and the Chiari. And I don't think um, we've really lost any correction. So we're gonna keep an eye on that top hook and we can do a limited revision down the road if need be. But um, I probably shouldn't have pulled quite as hard on those two hooks um, with doing that differential um, correction at, uh, towards the end of the case. Um, but overall, I, I think um, our, our outcome is good. And uh, um, pick this case just to, to illustrate um, use of halo gravity traction and then also utilizing these translates tethers, uh, which have been a very nice addition to the um, Medtronic toolkit for uh, complex speeds cases. Typically when I place a translace, I've done a ponte through that level um, with, uh, you know, usually where you're wanting the translace is a level that you want mobility. And so the ponte gives you additional mobility and flexibility. Um, and it also makes it quite easy to pass the tether. It, it's very easy to pass it either proximal to distal or distal to proximal. And it really kind of depends on the uh, adjacent anatomy. Um, being a right-handed surgeon, I think distal to proximal is a little bit more natural for me. Um, but now with the varying um, flexibility options that you have for that uh, leader and the tip of the translace, uh, it really uh, gives you some, some options for uh, the situa specific situation that you're in and whether you're in the thoracic spine right against the spinal cord or you're in the lumbar spine where you have a little bit more um, leeway with uh, how uh, much pressure you're putting on the dura, uh, but you also you typically have to pass the, the tether over a larger sublaminar distance. Um, so in that case, the stiffer translaces may be a bit more helpful. Um, uh, and uh, I've found either a small right angle clamp or a um, nerve hook is a great thing uh, to use to grab the, uh, the end of the tether as it comes through um, the inner space and uh, uh, gently bring it out uh, 
uh, of the canal. Uh, as I tension them, uh, really, I think you have to be aware of how many translaces you have, just similar to, you know, when we use the sequential reducers on the screws uh, or reduction screws, um, the more um, translaces you're engaging, then the more the forces are distributed. Um, and uh, so the more you can uh, really kind of pull on each one and uh, also being aware of the bone quality. In my experience, the laminar bone is actually pretty strong, but um, you know, again, here in, in this uh, nerve fibromatosis patient, I, uh, I didn't go for broke. I got a good correction and I didn't get too greedy. Um, and I really like to just kind of feel the tension in the, in the translace uh, with, a, with a right angle, uh, just so you can really feel it um, tighten up and, and get a, a sense of, of how much you're pulling on the lamina. So this is my fourth and last case to present. This is not a deformity case. I'll, I'll preface with that, but an interesting case nonetheless. Um, and one uh, where I, I think I, um, I ended up doing this case differently than I may have a couple years earlier uh, when I wasn't quite as uh, comfortable with navigation or aware of the, the capabilities of the navigated instruments. So this is an eight-year-old uh, boy who presented to our emergency department with two weeks of back pain and pretty substantial constipation, which was out of the norm for him. Uh, on a uh, extensive uh, history and physical, he was otherwise healthy. Um, he had not had fevers, chills, weight loss. Um, um, he had no uh, lymphadenopathy or other abnormal findings. But on radiographs, uh, he was seen to have uh, this sort of acute interspinous widening at the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, and a fair amount of uh, valve distension, as you can see here. Um, those were the, really the only initial abnormal findings on this child's uh, history, uh, but the uh, interspinous widening did correlate with the location of his back pain. Neurologically, he was totally intact. Um, uh, sphincter exam was, was normal. Uh, he was ambulatory uh, with no lower extremity uh, strength or sensory deficits. Advanced imaging was done, uh, which showed a pretty substantial amount of uh, lysis of the posterior elements at L1. Uh, on the far left, you have the sagittal view. Uh, middle is the uh, coronal view. Um, and uh, then axial view on the right, near complete uh, obliteration of the uh, pedicles. Uh, MR showed this large cystic mass uh, with substantial intrusion into the spinal canal at the level of conus. Uh, you can see that there are numerous fluid fluid levels, and so the working diagnosis was aneurysmal bone cyst. We uh, confirmed that with a percutaneous biopsy and uh, made plans for a, a, a pretty urgent uh, resection of this lesion. Uh, we ended up doing it over a weekend. Um, and uh, I recommended to the parents that we attempt to uh, resect this as an on block. Uh, resection to uh, minimize the chance of further recurrence. Family agreed, and so I uh, felt that if I was able to get a, uh, a good, good access uh, through the transverse processes of T12 and L1, and then gradually work around the tumor um, laterally uh, and uh, find a good uh, dural plane, without getting into the lesion itself, then we had a, a good chance of success. Um, our uh, Medtronic team had introduced me to the navigated osteotomes for um, some cases a while back. In fact, we had used those on um, some sacral dome resections for high-grade spondylolisthesis. And so the, I um, wanted to use uh, that instrument uh, to uh, uh, try to uh, get as uh, clean a resection as I could of this lesion uh, to remove it off the uh, posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. So here's some intra-op pictures. Uh, we did a wide exposure, placed our um, pedicle screws above and below initially so that if we needed to close or stabilize in a hurry, then we had those fixation points already in place. Um, and, uh, and then began to uh, gradually work around uh, the tumor. Uh, uh, here I had already made uh, some uh, cuts through the uh, spinous processes of T12 and L2 uh, to get my proximal and distal um, uh, uh, cuts. And then uh, 
worked around it uh, laterally through um, essentially a lateral extracavitary type trajectory uh, towards the pedicles. Here are some uh, intraoperative pictures of our navigated osteotome. And you can see that I was able to uh, really get a good visualization of where um, the tumorous uh, bone stopped and the normal bone started right at the uh, junction of the pedicle and the body. And then uh, attempted to essentially amputate the, the base of the pedicles bilaterally and lift those off with the tumor. Here is our unblock uh, uh, specimen after uh, we were uh, able to remove it uh, with the dorsal view on the left and a ventral view on the right. And uh, very typical um, and to me always interesting findings of this uh, cystic tumor, um, which was entirely consistent with uh, what we had seen on the image. So six months post-op, he was doing great. Um, bowel and butter, or excuse me, bowel function had returned to uh, complete uh, normality um, soon after the operation, minimal back pain. Uh, he's a very active kid and has been doing great. Um, we did get an MRI. There was no evidence of recurrence. Um, our plan was an MRI every six months up to two years and then annual follow-up for probably two or three years thereafter with MRIs and then spreading it out a bit. Um, the family has now relocated out of state and we connected them with uh, uh, colleagues uh, in uh, St. Louis so that his follow-up could be continued. So clearly I don't have long-term follow-up on this kid um, to prove that this on-block resection was curative, um, but uh, everything right now points to a good outcome. And uh, I was happy with um, the uh, capability of the, of the navigated instruments that made it uh, um, fairly uh, uh, straightforward to make that rather difficult cut uh, underneath the nerve root and underneath the uh, tumor. Um, in removing it, there was one small piece of the uh, uh, pedicle that sort of crumbled uh, and did not come out with the main specimen. Um, uh, but uh, we felt that we are, you know, ultimately with the bone that was left behind was, was normal bone not involved in the tumor. In reflecting back, I think if I had done this all with fluoro or just, you know, an, uh, anatomic visualization, I probably would have had to make a much wider exposure and do more um, retroperitoneal dissection, you know, really um, visualize a lot around the lateral and, and going towards the anterior aspect of that vertebra just to make sure I could get a good trajectory and good visualization as my osteotome went, you know, more or less right into the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. Um, with the navigation, I think I was able to do that um, probably with more um, um, accuracy and with, with, with less dissection um, and uh, just a cleaner osteotome cut, uh, which is always satisfying to, uh, uh, to any surgeon just to see a nice, nice clean cut. So that's where I found it was helpful. Uh, also, just having the, the navigation intraoperatively to really cue you into exactly where you were anatomically you know, what, even if you're just using the, uh, um, just the, the net, what we call it, the, the uh, I call it the wand, some people call it the turkey, the turkey foot, you know, the, the, the probe, the navigated probe uh, can really just help you to orient to exactly where you are. So even if you make the actual cut with a traditional osteotome or some other instrument, um, you know, you do have good intraoperative um, confirmation uh, that you're imaging and what you're seeing are, are matching up. And just reviewing a few things about spinal aneurysmal bone cysts. Um, this is a nice review paper from 2019 uh, where uh, there were 42 patients with a wide age range, uh, both adults and pediatric patients. Uh, the majority were in the lumbar spine as was the case with our patient, uh, although also common in the cervical spine. Um, in this uh, case series, they had 12 on block resections and 30 interlesional keratages. And overall disease-free survival was about 54%, which I think is a number that we would all hope to improve on. Um, but uh, not surprisingly, their on-block resections were associated with higher disease-free survival by a with a substantial significance. Um, and uh, you know, with, uh, ABCs and giant cell tumors in the spine you know, being uh, just aggressive, locally aggressive benign tumors uh, using the uh, Weinstein-Boriani uh, uh, staging system to really uh, plan your um, your resection in a way that you can uh, maximize your chances for non-block resection, I think is the best strategy. Obviously not always possible. I had a giant cell tumor uh, 
a while back that was completely circumferential. And in that case, your, your by definition going to have to um, have an interlesional resection. But um, uh, really studying your anatomy and utilizing all your um, uh, imaging and navigation techniques that you have at hand, I think is a, a great way to, to, to maximize your chances for a successful uh, resection. So, and reflecting back on these cases, I reviewed the, the literature as I presented tonight, and uh, um, always good to, to study your, your own cases and, and look retrospectively at what you could do uh, better in, in hindsight. Appreciate the, the insight of the authors of those papers in, in terms of summarizing uh, their findings for us. And uh, just quickly going through uh, the uh, disclosure slides here. So uh, we did uh, utilize the Schiller system and uh, navigation and the translate system. So I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to review these cases and uh, uh, hopefully you found it interesting and uh, fully admit people would have, uh, other people may have tackled these problems differently and I'd love to hear uh, our other thoughts on how to do it, but uh, uh, rewarding cases uh, all around and thank you for your time.